I love like Southern stuff, shrimp and grits, pimento cheese, you know, catfish, that kind of stuff, which is interesting. Yeah. And I'm not from here. I'm from New England originally. So these are things that I've kind of um, found a love for here. You know, I think it, it was important for me to, you know, I moved to Maryland to start kind of looking at what are mid-Atlantic foods, you know, what are kind of Southern foods, what are people around here like? Uh, and then if I could bring my own influences. So sometimes it's traditional, take shrimp and grits. You know, I think a lot of people know what that is, but I also love foods from Spain. So sometimes it's going to be a Spanish inspired shrimp and grits. So there's maybe Manchego cheese in the grits and do a tom tomato component, but have it based on like a Spanish brava sauce and there's smoked paprika and sherry vinegar in there. And instead of doing a bacon or an andouille, doing like a Spanish serrano ham. So sometimes I'll keep it strictly traditional or sometimes I'll bring in some other things that really excite me and make it, you know, a little different. Welcome to Winning at Work, the podcast for foodies, founders, and food and beverage professionals. You know, if you wanted to discover a new brand, a new food or beverage to try, there are literally thousands of companies out there. It is very difficult to do that. That's why we curate the different, the better, and the special brands here each and every week so you don't have to do the heavy lifting. If you're a founder and you're looking to connect with other like-minded executives, we make that very easy. And if you just work in the food and beverage industry and you're looking for fresh inspiration, we have that here in spades. This episode is sponsored by Temple. Congratulations, you're selling in retail. But the competition is fierce and your brand is surrounded by similar products. How will consumers find you? Let Temple show you an innovative retail sales solution. Click on the Attract Consumers link below. Need to attract great employees? Click on the Hire Now below and we'll show you how to use your culture to help you stand out. Stay tuned for this week's episode. Welcome to Winning at Work, everybody. It is Tony. And, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking about how brands are branding. You know, packaging is so important. You can use uh, an Amazon page to kind of fine tune your DTC you might have focus groups. There's all kinds of different ways that you can focus on how you want to set your brand apart because it is, as we know, hugely, hugely competitive on shelf or online. But what about your personal brand? What about the techniques and the strategies that you might use to build out your own personal brand? And really what I'm thinking of today, because of our guest, we have Chris Spear. He's the owner and he's the chef of Perfect Little Bites. He also has a, a really cool podcast I want you guys to check out. It's uh, Chefs Without Restaurants. Um, ironically, it looks like, Chris, you've been in podcasting as long as I have, roughly. We guys, we're like uh, two guys opposite ends of the spectrum here a little bit. Dinosaurs. Di well, first of all, the first rule is Dinosaurs we never, are dead, though. We're still alive and kicking. Exactly. We never date ourselves either. So first, I guess no. let's, let's just get that out there. We never, we don't date. Um so what I wanted to do today, you know, with, with Chris is I want to explore this space of what does a, a very creative person do to brand themselves? And I'm really thinking about those chefs because so many chefs have inspired businesses and products. But what if you don't want to get into the world of CPG? You know, what if you don't want to get into the world of food service? What if you just really want to cook and you get a lot of joy uh, from bringing joy and satisfaction and nourishment to people. And I thought, you know, Chris is an excellent person for us to talk to today because it's it's Maryland, right? That's the area that's that you're. Yeah, I'm in Maryland. I'm outside of uh, both Baltimore and D.C. So hugely, you know, huge population density. There are lots of places to, you know, kind of expand your brand. Chris, thank you so much for coming down today, taking off the uh, the cooking apron, laying down the knives. And, and coming to talk to us at Winning at Work. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you today. Thanks for having me. So explain this journey that you went through, you know, as someone who loves to cook and it kind of morphs into that corporate chef and then your realization that maybe this is not the right place and then you move out onto your own and open your own business. Kind of walk us through what did that look like for you? Well, that's a very long path, so I'll try to give you the abbreviated version. I've been in <laughs> that's food. A softball, 30, Chris. I've been in food 
31 years now. I'm, I'm 47. I started at 16. Food's all I ever wanted to do. Went to culinary school. The part about culinary school, I'll tell you as it relates to the story, is it was expensive. I came out of uh, four-year culinary school, bachelor program, Johnson & Wales. Uh, I will always remember my student loan repayment was $404 a month for 10 years. That's a lot. And that was in the late 90s. That was, you know, uh, I actually it was close to like what I was paying in rent, right? And even though I had a degree, I started going and applying at restaurants and places and they wanted to start me off at $8 an hour, $9 an hour, you know, quite often no benefits. How am I going to survive on that? And I went and uh, went to a, a job fair at a retirement community and they were offering me eleven fifty and every other weekend off and, you know, no nights beyond 8 p.m. and 401k and all this stuff. I was like, huh, it's interesting. I went to culinary school for four years and they never really talked about like working in a retirement community or contract food service. You know, I thought I was going to come out and be a chef of a restaurant or a resort or something like that. And I took the job and I, I really enjoyed it. And Worked there a couple of years, moved to Seattle with my wife and uh, got out there. And I thought, you know, reboot, I'm going to apply at restaurants and places like that. And it's kind of the same thing, even though it was three years later, I still wasn't getting great offers. And I found another retirement community and, and that kind of started like my path working in contract food service and, and so forth. So um, my podcast is Chefs Without Restaurants. I say that I've worked in 30 years in food service, but never in a restaurant because I have worked in catering. I have worked as a catering director at a hospital. I worked at Ikea. I've done some research and development. So my path has never been in a restaurant. And one of the things I want to do is talk about the fact that you can love food, you can love cooking, you can have a long, fantastic career in this industry without that 90 hours a week, you know, working every holiday, you know, everything that they tell you about the restaurant industry. And, and it's, why it's so tough. hard, Chris. And it is, it's still tough working in contract food service. I was still a, a salaried manager who was working lots of hours. I still had to work, you know, at a retirement community. They live there 365 days a year. So I was still there holidays, probably even more so than if you worked at a, a few other places that actually close on, say, Christmas. But um, yeah, so that's been my path was never working in restaurants, but trying to have a successful career some some way in food and, and find my own path. And then you, so... But then you did make it into a corporate, did you not? Corporate being, I worked for Sodexo, um, right. doing contract food service. Yeah, so exactly. uh, but I was at a retirement community. Okay, so That's I was where there. You got the retirement community through yeah. that. Got it. Yeah, because places like that don't want to run their own food service. I mean, quite often they try, but you know, let's be honest. If you're the CEO of a retirement community, you'd rather hire the experts to come and do that. So when you hire a Sodexo, you know, we come in as a package with a GM, chef, sous chef, dietitian, all that stuff. Uh, and my last job before I started my own business, I was at one place for ten years and just stayed there and worked my way. Well, I didn't work my way up. I actually was in the same position the whole time I was there. Really? Yeah. Well, that's insourcing. You know, they. It might look like outsourcing, but they really insource that entire operation, you know, under one roof. And I think that is a very smart way to go for for that type of business. Um, and I've seen that in, of course, you know, large Fortune 500 companies, they do the same thing. So when did it occur to you that you could transition out and start your own personal journey, making your own brand, you know, to the consumer? That you sure. could be a, a personal chef for them. I uh, before I even moved to Maryland, this was now probably fifteen years ago or so. I was living in Pennsylvania outside of Philly. Uh, I worked for a very brief time at a catering company. My wife actually worked there, and I wanted to pick up some hours. And while I was there, uh, we would have people all the time contact them to do a anniversary dinner for two or a small dinner party for six. You know, we were a big catering company. We were doing parties for 200 and corporate things. It didn't make sense it, financially to go send a team out to do a dinner for two. But at one point, the owners did say to me, hey, would you want to do this? Uh, you can use the kitchen. You know, we'll get the product in for you. You can keep whatever there is for profit. Just do it under our, our name because, you know, it, it could be great lead gen for us. You know, those people then may have a child getting married and we're going to get their 200 person wedding or their, you know, corporate luncheon. And I did that for a very brief time, but the spark was there. And I said to my wife, is this a thing? Like, could I be a catering company where I cooked for like two to 20 people? Like the term like micro catering didn't exist at the time, but that's really what I was thinking. Um, you know, low overhead, not necessarily having to have employees. 
Uh, and could I be really creative? And it, it was just kind of kicked around in my head. And then we moved to Maryland and great location. I mean, Frederick, where I live, great food scene, but I easily can get into DC, Northern Virginia, Baltimore, even Southern Pennsylvania, West Virginia. So um, I just started playing around with that. And I saw a thing for the United States Personal Chef Association. They were having a two-day in-person workshop on how to be a personal chef. And I went. And, and a lot of that was geared to doing meal prep and stuff in people's homes, not doing kind of dinner parties, what I do. But it did address things like basic marketing, liability, you know, legalities, like what you need to do from an insurance standpoint and all of that. So I just started tinkering around with that while I was working my job. And I, I probably would have been ready to go sooner, but then my wife and I had twins. So, you know, I was like two years into kind of side hustling and then the conversation was, you know, well, my wife's not going to go back to work for a while. And when she does, it'll be part time. And, you know, someone needs that full income and health benefits and all that things that keep you shackled to a job. Don't um, they ever. Yeah, don't they. But, the, you know, then once my kids got into elementary school, my wife went back to work full time again and was able to, you know, get a full time salary and bring in benefits. And we said, you know, it's now or never. And uh, that was seven years ago, just about now, uh, November 6th. Uh, 2016 was my last day of work at the job I'd been at for 10 years. So you freed yourself seven years ago. Freed myself in some ways, shackled myself in other ways. But <laughs> well, yes, I mean, no, leave it. Yes, I, I left the job Yeah, in 2016 to go out and do this personal chef thing on my own full time. So I was I was thinking, OK, if if I wanted a personal chef to come in and cook, the first, I guess there's a, a number of thoughts that come to me. First of all, you know, who is this person that I'm, you know, letting into my house? What do they specialize in? You know, are they going to cook what I want? Um, you know, just kind of what that dynamic was. And I was thinking, you know, that's probably kind of a hard business to advertise. I would feel like that's a kind of that classic kind of word of mouth. What have you found is really, really works for, for chefs in this space? Word of mouth is obviously huge. Reviews are huge. Oh, and reviews. You, you talked yes. about branding, right? That That's what it is. Before Perfect Little Bites was a personal chef business, it was a blog. It was a food blog. And for a number of years, people referred to me as a blogger. And I, I kind of hated that. I saw it as like a pejorative term. Like, no, I'm a chef. I'm just using it because it was so new. I mean, I started the blog Perfect Little Bites in 2010. And I wanted it to be, you know, content. Now we talk about content marketing and all that stuff, but that's what I was doing because I do customized dinners and they're all personalized. I wanted people to kind of be able to pull the curtain back and see what I was doing. And this is my thought process. And this is kind of what I like. And it's not for everyone. It was almost to exclude a certain populationist. You know, I like to dog on the Cheesecake Factory and the Olive Garden, but like if that's your culinary preferences, I am not for you. So maybe having me have a whole roasted pig's head on a table is going to have some people opt out. Um, <laughs> but you know, re reviews Wait, are huge, that, right? Do you, know? you do that? Uh, so I have done some of those head to tail dinners. And for a while, one of my actually before I revealed myself, because I was working a job and was afraid people like my bosses were going to find out that I was moonlighting or whatever. My avatar was me holding a raw pig's head in front of my face. And then I was kind of like, why am I not getting more calls for dinners, you know? But uh, I was afraid to put <laughs> my face on the internet. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's a turnoff. And it actually didn't stop people from hiring me. Uh, and then you got to the point where it was just like, I'm going to do my thing and it is what it is, you know? Uh, but yeah, it, it all comes down to branding and positioning. Like, where are you in the market? I wanted to be high end. I wanted, you know, my dinners have always started at a minimum of $100 a head when there's people out there doing $30 dinners. For me, I always wanted to bring linen napkins, bring my own china, have it be an experience. Um, you know, instead of going out for your wife's birthday, have me come in, do that. So just I, from a very early on in this, um, you know, I listened to a lot of business, a big Gary Vee fan, you know, listening to those people and, and talking about, you know, what makes you stand out and, and how do you convey your story to people? So for me, the storytelling was in place long before I even started cooking for people. You know, Chris, I, it just hit me that what you're doing really does play to the Instagrammableness of today's society and content. I'm going to tell you, there is no way a chef comes over and 
puts a beautiful meal on the table and there's not an accompaniment of great photos that are plastered all over that person's Facebook or Insta, whatever it is, like hashtag home chef hash. I mean, that I would think that in and of itself would just create so much buzz from everybody. Like, hey, where did you do this? How'd you find him? And da 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 da. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things is with like business social media pages, they say keep them for business. You know, you don't you should have your personal and your business separate. But for me, it was important to have some elements of my home life because I think this is so personal. You're inviting me into your home. Isn't it great to see me out in the pumpkin patch with my kids? You know, I'm a family man. You know, because you're not some monster who puts yes, on us, you know, who comes I'm trying in to and- cultivate this relationship with my customers. And I almost want them to feel like they know me and vice versa by the time I get into your house. I've always wanted my business to be less transactional and more personal. And that's something I I've guests on my podcast. I have friends, we don't always agree with it. It's like taking deposits. Not that there's anything wrong with money, but I feel once it becomes like you start talking about money too much and it becomes transactional. It's just very much like you're the customer. I'm the person providing a service. And I'm, you know, I, I grew up in a day and age where my dad said, you know, your, your word and your handshake was the deal. And that's all it was. And, and I've never been screwed. If I say, I'm going to come cook dinner for you on Friday and it's 300 bucks and you say, okay, then that's good for me. And then, you know, the money thing will work itself out. No one's ever not paid me or something. And I have people say, that's crazy. But I just feel like it changes the relationship with the customer. Yeah, I could imagine that kind of cheapens or kind of just takes away from the experience, you know, to be going through some kind of a Venmo transaction before you come out. Yeah, I don't know. And the same with contracts. You know, a lot of people have these contracts of, I will do this, you will do that, I will do this, you will do that, you sign this, you send it to me by this day. Like, that's fine. I guess it's a CYA in some, you know, instances. But again, I've never had a problem with that. So I don't do contracts. I don't do invoices. Um, I've been doing this for like 11 years and I've never been burned or had a problem. So So no invoices. No, it's just I, you know, it's an email. Hey, Tony, I'm coming to your house. You know, I'm cooking for you and your wife. It's going to be 200 bucks. Here's how I take you can pay me in cash credit. Here's my Venmo. Here's my Zelle. You can pay me day of. And that's and it. I've working, sent you an email. Working. Yeah. Yeah. Some businesses are a lot more complex. Of course, they require that. I would imagine workers' comp, liability, all those things could get in the way. But if you do have a good relationship with people, they're not looking to stick it to you either. Yeah. And I'm a solo person. I don't have employees. Uh, I don't report to anyone. You know, it's it's very easy in that. It's It would be different maybe if I had people who cooked under my name. You know, if I'm sending you out to someone's house and then, you know, I pay you and like, then there could be other things that happen. But right now it's just me and it allows me to be nimble and, and just get things done and do it the way that I want to get it done. Chris, what kind of food do you just love cooking? Or are you just so versatile? It's like whatever the the, the palates are, you can kind of adjust. Like what's your go-to? Yeah, I'm really uh, – go-to is tacos. I love tacos. I love Mexican. I love authentic Mexican. I love Tex-Mex. Big uh, proponent of making your own tortillas at home. I think everyone should learn how to make tortillas because it's two ingredients and one of which is water. So it's so How do easy. you make them? That sounds delicious. Masa love- and water. Yeah, you buy um, – Masa Harina, like a dry product in a lot of grocery stores, there's a stuff called Maseka and I'm not going to get into like what that is and the quality. I use a brand called Masienda. Uh, I had the founder on my podcast. He put out a cookbook last year. He's sourcing high quality heirloom corn from Mexico. They're nixtamalizing it, grinding it. And you can either buy from them the corn and do it yourself. But he has a really great Masa Harina product and they just uh, got a deal where they're in all whole foods, which is huge for them because you know, I started buying it like five years ago and it was just, they shipped directly via mail. And now you can get their masa in Whole Foods and it's a game changer. And you just mix masa and water and let it rest five minutes, roll it into a ball and then, you know, press it out on a griddle, cast iron skillet, whatever, you know, you can get way more technical about it, but at its roots, it's just two ingredients. And one of those is water. Yeah. And, you know, the good for you movement is here to stay. Everyone wants, you know, healthier living. So it makes perfect sense for you when you're kind of positioning yourself as that kind of premium cook that you're going to be sourcing these wonderful meals. Do you ever, and I'm curious because obviously I'm not in your market, so I haven't had a chance to have a delicious meal. 
uh, maybe I do need to take a trip up there. <laughs> maybe just come to your house and you cook. You cook for sure. Me. Yeah, yeah. Sounds like a great time. <laughs> Love cooking for people. Yeah, look at that. I just, it's horrible. I invite myself into people's lives all the time. Um, as my wife says, I have a problem with that. Anyway, that's a side note. Um, when you're presenting the food, uh, you know, part of your presentation, are you also giving some of that backstory like that you just shared with me? You have to read the room. And again, this is something I talk about with other personal chefs on my podcast. Different people hire you for different reasons. It might be a corporate dinner. It might be people who don't really care about food. The amount of times that I have served food and you bring it out and they're talking and you can't even tell them what it is. Ideally, I want to drop the plate. They see that I'm there. They stop talking. Maybe the host says, hold on one second. Chris is here. And then I get to talk. Other times they don't. You come out and you bring the plates and there's 15 people and it's loud and you're putting food down and you can tell that nobody really cares. And at those parties, quite often you clear the plates and you've got, you know, this 12 ounce ribeye steak and there's maybe eight ounces left on the plate and you're just scraping it into the bin. Like the food is just an accessory for something else going on. Yeah, it's it's crazy. So you get a good feel. I mean, I can usually tell even before I go to a party based on phone calls and emails what the vibe is going to be. And then once you get there, you can tell really quickly if you're going to be the centerpiece of the dinner or just the help. Uh, And when you're just the help, quite often they don't really want to hear that story. But if they do, yes, there's more extended time. A dinner I did this past Saturday, I was in the dining room during the entree course for almost the whole thing. You know, we were just talking. And while they were eating, I was out there for 20 minutes, which is on the long end for me to just keep talking about food and cooking. But they kept asking questions and they were really interested. But that's not every party. And, you know, I'm okay with that. But I want to give you as much info as I can if you want that. So you don't have like um, like a one pager that you might print up that might you know talk about okay because I I've had I've had I've experienced some catering from certain groups where there's something yeah. unique you know and they'll kind of bring that out and place it so you can kind of see I, I was just curious because that's kind of I love that but you know the, everyone jokes on the internet about like every time you go to a restaurant now it's like there's the story and the spiel and if you dined with us before and you know explaining this is meant to be it's like just get on with it and bring me the food, right? Like that's, that's kind of the big joke that's about dining be, in the, restaurants these days, you know? Yeah, you know, you do get a little jaded to the, you know, it's a little over the top. It's a little too, too. They're trying too hard. But I think, yeah, so to your point, you know, reading the room and knowing who you're, you're, you're talking to. I guess when you go out and you lay it down and you set the plate, you know, if people are making eye contact with you, that's their, your first sign that they, oh, yeah. they see you and that, and that they recognize you. Okay, so Mexican is one of your favorites, you know, kind of authentic Mexican. Well, what else are what are some of your I love other fun? like southern stuff, shrimp and grits, pimento cheese, you know, catfish, that kind of stuff, catfish. which is interesting. Fish. Yeah, and I'm not from here. I'm from New England originally, so these are things that I've kind of um found a love for here. You know, I think it was important for me to, you know, I moved to Maryland to start kind of looking at what are mid-Atlantic foods, you know, what are kind of southern foods, what are people around here like? Uh, and then if I could bring my own influences, so sometimes it's traditional, take shrimp and grits. You know, I think a lot of people know what that is, but I also love foods from Spain. So sometimes it's going to be a Spanish inspired shrimp and grits. So there's maybe manchego cheese and the grits and do a tom- tomato component, but have it based on like a Spanish brava sauce and there's smoked paprika and sherry vinegar in there. And instead of doing a bacon or an andouille, doing like a Spanish serrano ham. So sometimes I'll keep it strictly traditional or sometimes I'll bring in some other things that really excite me and make it, you know, a little different. How difficult is it for you to go grocery shopping, reading labels these days? Because there is so much crap out there in our food system. And here you are curating some of the best food for people. What kind of pressure does that put on you just in your own personal life? Is it, do do you stress out over this or can you just be kind of easygoing and yeah I'm I'm easygoing about that I mean uh, if you're talking about anything that's like a a prepackaged thing I for the most part have my go-to brands and things I like and you know um, I think once you find some of those things and then there's things like I love ketchup I love Heinz ketchup I will never buy a natural ketchup, a low sugar, a a made with beets, any of that nonsense. Like, I don't care. It's a super processed product. Nobody in the world makes better ketchup than Heinz regular ketchup. End of story. I don't want in-house ketchup, but just things like that. And it's like, if that means I don't do all natural cooking or whatever, I'm okay with that. 
<laughs> that is so funny that you signaled out that that you singled out ketchup because we've we've talked quite a little bit about that because the role of sugar as an extender you know lets them use or anyone who's using you know process they can use less tomatoes and add that sugar but i have to admit i mean you're not wrong i want to on the <laughs> The flavor, I'm talking just straight flavor yeah. profile, straight, fl- you know, but of course you look at the labels um, and I've had some wonderful samples sent to me and I do use them and they are so much more tomatoey and zesty and I know you've tried them, but that's But a I think a lot, of it, a lot of what I think goes back into cooking and successful restaurants and things is nostalgia and reference points and stuff. And, you know, it, it gets hard if my, my nostalgia is definitely going to be different than yours, but like what we grew up eating, right? But I think that's like a classic flavor. I think people know it. And when you try something, even if you don't know that this has, you know, if you make a barbecue sauce and it has Heinz ketchup in it, I think it's going to have a flavor that's reminiscent of something you had growing up because that's what we all used. We weren't using a natural ketchup. And I just think there's some receptor, some kind of trigger that makes you feel hopefully comfortable when you have something like that. But obviously, you know, going forward, when I'm looking at new brands and things to bring in my home, yeah, I love small, you know, small batch, small companies, you know, companies that are doing things the right way. If you want to use the term artisanal or, you know, less ingredients, sure. My wife's a registered dietitian. Um, She used to be a chef, but she's a dietitian now and has a master's in public health. So, you know, we talk about food, food nutrition, food labels all the time. That's her full-time job. Uh, But we also have a lot of those products in our home that are, you know, processed condiments and and things of that nature. And, you know, my kids want to eat Kraft macaroni and cheese. I've tried making homemade. I've tried like the Annie's like, and they're okay, but... But again, you know, and this is a much bigger conversation, you know, how these companies have engineered these products to be crave worthy yes. between the salt, the, the fat, all of that stuff. That is hard. I don't want to eat a lot of processed foods and I don't want to be serving them. But there are some things that I just love. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because that is truly what's happened. They've engineered the food and as a result, they have engineered our taste buds and our palate. And you, if you're trying to go really against that, you're fighting against something that is so big and so powerful. The consumer has to want to do it. You can't force them into these behavior changes. And that's what I think a lot of companies are trying to do. They're trying to force these consumer behavior changes. Yes. I Mm -hmm. want to get your take on something. Um, Sure. Do you ever cook with plant-based foods? How do you, what, what's your... Um, what does plant-based foods mean? Does it mean, are you talking vegetables and vegetarian? Or are you talking artificially like... Meat. I don't eat like Beyond Meat and stuff like that. I think it's gross and terrible. I, I'm not, Okay, let me back up. I don't like the beef ones. I will eat like the artificial chicken. I actually like, uh, and I'm a big fan of Aldi grocery stores. I don't know if you have Aldi. We but have, they have Aldi like, in the South, yes. I really like their vegetarian chicken. Like I actually, like that's one of my things I keep in the freezer at all times is like their breaded chicken nuggets that's, you know, soy protein or whatever. And I love throwing those in the oven and making like a fried chicken sandwich with that. So I like that. I don't like the beef ones though. I think they're weird. They have an off taste, off flavor. I mean, at the end of the day, I think you're better off just eating true plant-based and vegetable I mean, I guess some of that, they're calling it plant-based. I don't think it's necessarily healthier. Like if you look at I don't a lot think of those some meats, of them are. you know, water, soybean oil, all these things. Going back to Aldi, they have a line of veggie burgers. And if you look at them, you know what every ingredient is there. They have a quinoa crunch burger and it has quinoa and it has red pepper and it has peas and it has corn. And, that's the way you to know, do it. Potato starch. You know, See, that's the I way to do it. it I make one at home that has walnuts and quinoa and chickpeas and things of that nature. So I'm a big fan of vegetarian cooking. I used to be a vegetarian. I think vegan food is really interesting right now. There's some cool stuff. I just, if I'm going to do it, I want to be healthier. And I think like, again, an overly processed product uh, that maybe doesn't even have like actual vegetables in it isn't a better product for you. I've seen some interesting developments where they they take beef and they blend it with chicken. This is not a new idea, but that is, you know, lessening the dependence on just red meat and the consumption around red meat and what it might take to be producing enough red meat. They blend it with chicken and it comes out very, very similar. I just had someone on the podcast 
uh, it was cross crossover meats was the name of it. Um, and they're frozen. And kind of to your point, it's great to just have something like that in the freezer. You can pop it out. You know, if you're if you're out of whatever you wanted to cook, just pull them out and they're frozen and they're and they're perfect. And there are some really good uh, chicken brands out there that or substitute chicken. There's some very, very good ones in that. I think chicken is further along, in my opinion, than beef. I, I do too. You know, from a number of years of eating in vegetarian restaurants, like the the TVP type stuff. The I used to go to a Vietnamese restaurant. They called it like mock duck, but it was like vital wheat wheat gluten. You know, that had this right the right texture of it. And once you cooked it up in sauce, it, it was delicious. But th- like a hamburger, I would rather just eat a vegetable burger or even like one of the chicken the chicks ones yes. before I have like a fake beef one. It just it's weird to me and I still eat beef. So I would rather eat a hamburger, a good real hamburger less often, and then just have like, you know, an actual veggie patty the other times. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I, that's what I see happening here too a lot. So before we, before we go, I want to know a little bit more about what your, some of your future plans are. Cause I know right now you kind of operate a solo have you given thought to or maybe what some of the pros and cons would be for you if you were to try to expand on your personal brand and maybe try to add more people to expand your reach? What uh, what's the future? Yeah, I'm not I, I'm not going to do that. If I'm going to expand, it's going to be through Chefs Without Restaurants. You know, I'm building a network there. I'm building a community before it was a podcast. It, it was a community. It is. We have a Facebook group with like 1500 members in it. It's something where I've looked at building an app for consumers to find personal chefs or working as almost like a marketing agency. Since I taught myself how to do this, if you want to now start a, you know, a personal chef business, can I build a course can it, or an ebook or something like that and grow business that way? That's the scalable aspect. I got out of what I did partially because I didn't want to be a manager anymore. You know, I was at a level where I had 125 employees who reported to me my daily success hinged on their success or failure. And you're getting calls at home because a 16 year old did something stupid. And like, I didn't, I don't show up to work. Yeah. I don't, I don't like that. I don't need that. I don't, you know, look at talking, going back to like reviews, read any reviews of any business out there. And 90% of the negative ones come from some interaction that not the owner, not the chef, but a frontline employer. So I went to this restaurant and the waitress was rude. I went to this restaurant and you know, The food was terrible and, you know, it was a night the chef wasn't there. I don't want to send you to go cook at those people's house and you not, you know, holding things to my standard. Maybe I'm too much of a control freak. I totally am okay with that, but I have like a certain standard and certain level and, and I'm doing what I do because I really enjoy it. The cooking process. If I start stepping back and become more of an office manager, that's not what I want to do. I could go make more money in, if I'm going to sit behind a computer, I can make more money doing something in a more lucrative field than managing a bunch of cooks and chefs. I want to go out and cook because I enjoy going out and cooking. So if I'm going to grow and scale, it's going to be through the Chefs Without Restaurants community. Yeah, well, I do encourage people to go check out that podcast because you've done a lot of great things there. You've had hundreds of guests. lots. Of, you've had some big name influencers on there too. So I definitely recommend people go check that out. If you like winning at work, you're going to love this podcast too over there with, with Chris. So, Chris, for people that are maybe in your geographic area, like what's the best way for them to connect with you and perhaps have you come down and, uh, you know, bring a pig head? Yeah. Or maybe uh, my business something, is, you know, even better. Yeah. Well, my business is called Perfect Little Bites. So perfectlittlebites.com. But I'm at Perfect Little Bites on social media, Facebook, Instagram there. You can find me there. You can DM me. You can follow along. I tell people if you're not in my geographic area, I'm always sharing recipes, blogging about recipes, cooking about food, uh, talking about food, giving cooking tips. So yeah, you know, follow along. Maybe you can learn some some tips and tricks. Maybe you can pick up some recipes. Uh, I do about a 70 mile travel radius from Frederick, Maryland. So again, that's like DC, Northern Virginia, Baltimore, but I go into like Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. I go up to York, Lancaster, PA. For the right price, I travel. I know a lot of chefs who do travel things. I mean, I'm always amazed when someone says, yeah, this client paid for me to come down to Florida and cook for them for a week, you know? So if any of your listeners are out there and, you know, want to fly me out or have me commute out to wherever they are, I'm open to that as well. Well, you know, weather dependent, that could be a pretty, a pretty good gig, you know, flying down to Miami or, you know, kind of get out of the cold. Yeah. 
or take the, the, you know, I think that's one of the great things. And we didn't even talk about collaboration, but one of the things I love doing is cooking with other people. So it's like, oh, I've got a buddy up in Boston. Like, what if like I went up and hung out with him for a week and we did like one pop up dinner like that would pay for the trip and I get to hang out and my family could come along and, you know, just take one day out of our trip and go do a, a dinner, you know, make a thousand, couple thousand dollars and that would, you know, pay for the time up there. That sounds fantastic. Chris, I'm so glad we had a chance to finally share this out on the platform because you and I, you know, we've known each other for a while. We've been talking about this stuff offline. So it's so good that you're able to come down, expose winning at workers to, you know, what it's like kind of building that personal brand as a chef. And, you know, that strategy is, is certainly a good one with the collaboration and kind of building that community, right, to kind of get those reviews and let people see that, you know, there's a, a family man kind of behind the scenes kind of take away the mystery of it all. Chris, so appreciate you coming down here today. Well, thanks so much. I'm so glad we could do this.